the robots are here. It's not an invasion, but a revolution. These machines will soon be part of our lives, and they look remarkably like us. If we want to build robots that can interact with human beings, then we need to behave like human beings. Robothespian is about recreating life with a machine. Walking is easy for a man, but really hard for a robot. When you see this robot, you can see life inside it. We've seen the future, and this is what it looks like. Let's discover the best of Europe's humanoid robots. A new breed is evolving throughout Europe. A breed composed of creatures that look like us. But they're not flesh and bone. Instead, they are metal, motors and silicon. And very soon, they may live amongst us. These are the results of a fascinating line of research in robotics. These are humanoid robots. One of them looks endearingly like a child. Its name is iCub, created at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa. It's now deployed in over 20 laboratories worldwide. iCub is used as an open platform for research and development in several aspects of humanoid robots, from engineering to behavior. Thanks to its many sensors and its learning capabilities, iCub can interact with people, respond to voice commands, and recognize different objects. I will teach you a new object. Great. Show me the new toy. I will learn a new object. Where is the octopus? I think this is the octopus. iCub is a complete platform. It has uh, sensors to see and to feel, so it can feel touch and forces when it interacts with the environment. It has been designed with sophisticated hands, which means a lot of joints that can move. And uh, the idea is that it can use the hands to explore the environment. And what we do with the iCub is to combine um, sensors and these sophisticated uh, movement abilities to create intelligent behaviors. These intelligent behaviors can allow the robot to interact with objects, to interact with people, and uh, learn about the environment automatically. And there's a very specific reason why this robot has been built to resemble a child of about three to four years of age. Building a child robot is interesting because it allows us to uh, study the problem of learning. So instead of building a robot that knows already how to do something, uh, we rather build a robot that interacts with the environment. This baby robot is a perfect example of what roboticists throughout the world are striving for, making humanoid robots more human. It is a complex task that requires the perfect balance of engineering, mechanics and cognitive studies. Some argue that it's also a bit like playing God. The human race has always been fascinated by the idea of creating an artificial being as a companion for work and for social interaction. Creating something is a way for the human to transcend its mortality and creating something almost human is a very strong way of transcending the short limit of time that we have here on this earth. 
iCub and other projects are laying the foundations for a future in which robots will share our everyday spaces. And to do so, they not only need to be shaped like us, they need to interact with us in a safe way. We need robots that we can trust. BERT, a humanoid robot designed in the UK at the Bristol Robotics Lab, has been created with this goal. BERT is an upper body humanoid robot that has been specifically designed to investigate safe human-robot interaction. And what we mean by this is to create a machine that interacts with a human in a shared space so that we don't have collisions or misunderstandings. And one important concept in behavioral safety is shared attention. So, for example, if humans, two humans, talk to each other and hand over an object, several interesting things happen. For example, if I talk about an object, I tend to look at this object just before. And when I mention that object, the other human then tends to look at the object too. So, in our work, we try to create a robot that has the capability to, to do exactly the same. Per interagire meglio con le persone, i robot devono essere sicuri, robusti e attraenti. Meet Reem, a service robot designed by PAL Robotics in Barcelona, Spain. Until just a few decades ago, the word robot, which comes from the Czech robota, meaning slave, traditionally referred to large arm-shaped machines used in factories for industrial production. Now, the once derogatory word suggests something more like this. But there are still many hurdles to overcome before we can safely integrate these robots in our world. And not all these hurdles are technological. Le tre leggi della, della robotica di Asimo sono niente rispetto a quello che incontriamo ogni giorno eh, a livello di certificazione per poter mettere i robot in entorni reali. Finora la legislazione ci obbligava a fermare il robot nel momento in cui si rilevava la presenza di persone vicino al robot. Mentre quello che un robot di servizio deve fare è giustamente andare incontro alle persone, interagire con le persone e cercare di aiutarle nel modo in cui è stato programmato. I robot come questo ci renderanno la vita più facile. Reem is one of the very first service robots available for purchase, and it's been designed as a guide for museums, shopping malls, and other public spaces. It can offer people information and guidance through its touchscreen and is able to interpret commands and respond to inquiries with speech. I am part of your world now. To make it all work, a perfect integration between hardware and software is needed, and real-world tests can't start soon enough for robots like this. When we meet someone, we shake hands. It's a basic form of human interaction that many people happily apply to robots as well. But robotic arms and hands are often made of stiff mechanical parts. Bert is still a very traditionally designed robot, so it has stiff joints and stiff arms, and it is intuitive to understand that a stiff robot can be potentially dangerous. And really, we humans are very different. We are actually quite soft. Even though we have hard bones, our muscles are soft. They can move, they are like springs. They're not just gearboxes for metal. That's why roboticists are coming up with a new model for the design of artificial limbs one that takes inspiration directly from the human body. The next class of robotic arms may be inspired by bones, muscles and tendons. This robot is built from the inside out. Most humanoid robots just imitate the shape of a person, but we're really trying to look inside and understand how the muscles, how the tendons, how the joints of the body all come together to produce the, uh, the performance of a human body.
This is Eche Robot, and it looks eerily like a person with no skin and just one large singular eye. Eche's design so intricately imitates the human anatomy that it even has to rest its back. As part of a project, we developed what we think is one of the most realistic spines ever made, right down to the level of having gel in between the discs, which turns out to be crucial for how it functions. Um, humans actually get shorter by about an inch during the course of a day as this gel compresses, and the same is true of the robot, which has to lie down overnight to allow it to stretch out again. So we're dealing with the new ecosystems of robots uh, supposed to operate uh, inside the human body or outside the human body or close to the humans. Uh, these robots have to be, first of all, very friendly. That means they have to be uh, flexible and they have to be compliant. In order to get uh, compliant robots, we need to develop new materials uh, that are inspired by nature. Flexible materials, responsive to electric stimuli, and generally speaking, materials that can make the robot uh, as soft as uh, a human being. So this class of technologies will be developed together with the, with the new robots uh, so that uh, we will imitate the evolutionary pathway to reproduce uh, beings like uh, animaloids, humanoids, uh, capable to operate uh, close to the humans uh, in normal environments. Robots have a lot to learn from human anatomy, especially in the case of arms and hands, which are among the most complex components of a humanoid robot and the ones that could most frequently come into contact with people. Many researchers are creating new robotic limbs that will equip tomorrow's humanoid robots. This is a new type of robotic arm. It was inspired in the development by the human arm. We wanted to build a full arm with a hand, um, with, uh, which is capable uh, to do the same motions and has the same strength and the same dexterity as a human has. The arm is being developed at Munich's German Aerospace Center, and it's very close to the human equivalent in both weight and size. Even its peak energy expenditure is similar to that of a human arm. Just like our muscles, this generates excess heat, which requires the arm to be equipped with a liquid cooling system that looks remarkably like a network of veins and arteries. And the hand at the extremity of this arm is among the most sophisticated ever built. Our robotic hand has 19 degrees of freedom, which is approximately the same as a human does. This is much more than a classic robotic hand, which has approximately 2 to 9 degrees of freedom. Thanks to this, we can handle objects of different shapes very easily and we can grasp them and manipulate them like the human can do. These robotic arms created at the Industrial Robotics and Informatics Institute of Barcelona have a more traditional structure, but an extremely innovative control algorithm. They can come into direct contact with a person without causing any harm. To put uh, robotic arms in human environments, they need to be safe. There is a lot of investigations how we can make robots safe. Uh, our approach is trying to design new control algorithms to uh, accomplish that safety by construction, not on the long-term control loop, but on the very low-level control loop. And this means that we are investigating how we can make robots soft emotions that if they, while they are performing its task, uh, they encounter a human, they just not hit, not uh, uh, hurt the human, but behave in a very controllable manner where the human feels comfortable with him. A structure that more closely resembles the human anatomy and has smart control algorithms is a good starting point to make these machines safer for human interaction. But to be really useful in tasks and environments where humans normally work, humanoid robots need to reach a proficient level of manual dexterity. This is one of the research goals of Isla, a service robot being developed in Bremen at the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. 
The focus of our work is on manipulation. We are especially interested in using two arms for manipulation and usually you require two arms when you want to carry heavy objects. Uh, so you, one arm can help the other arm, let's say. And the other is to do complex operations, for example, using tools, hand tools, a drill machine. Um, and there we, we need a certain dexterity of the hands. We need uh, certain flexibility. We need sensors on the hands that can also sense and be very delicate with certain objects. Isla can be teleoperated from a distance by an engineer wearing an exoskeleton. The robot faithfully reproduces every movement, which makes it ideal for working in harsh and demanding environments like space, in situations where it would be impractical or too risky to send a human being. In this mock-up module of the International Space Station, Isla is working as a robot astronaut. The arms only weigh five and a half kilos, but they can lift weights of up to eight, which means that the robot has a lightweight arm construction with a payload to weight ratio greater than one. The hands are extremely human-like and offer an unprecedented level of dexterity and precision. A slow, delicate touch is not what we usually expect from a robot, but in fact their computer brains and responsive motors mean they are in a strong position for split-second reactions. This robot is able to catch a flying ball, or even two. Back at Munich's German Aerospace Center, we meet Justin one of the most advanced robotic platforms in the world. Justin is perfect for studying the interplay between perception and action. The robot doesn't simply rely on its many sensors to produce a reaction, but rather on a more complex system that imitates the way our brain thinks and works. It's not hard for a robot to react quickly, even insects can do this, but to behave in a complex environment in a sensible way, you need more human-like skills and this kind of cognitive capabilities we want to bring into this uh, robotic platform. This robot comes close to the agility and responsiveness of a six-year-old child. This version of Justin has a wheelbase, but another variation called Toro has been specifically designed for walking on two feet. Sometimes that comes easy for a man, but not for a robot. Building a walking robot is challenging, um, mainly because of uh, the balance. Keeping the balance with only two legs is more challenging than keeping it, for instance, with four legs in contact with the ground. On top of that, uh, we challenge our control algorithms by using a smaller feet than usual. Our feet are only 19 centimeters long, and uh, this creates additional challenges for keeping the balance. Uh, of course, it's easier to keep the balance if you use really large feet, but that makes the robot, for the robot more difficult the task of going into environments where you have limited space for stepping. For instance, if you have very uh, cluttered environments or very rough environments, you might have very limited space for putting the robot on the ground. Well, think about walking, you know, even for us, when we are kids and when we learn it, it's, it's quite tough. And the same thing, you know, to do that with mechanics and robots is, is a difficult thing uh, in terms of coordination, combining everything and so on and balancing. At the same time, it's also very important. It's a very versatile way to move. We are able to walk on a street or to climb on a rock in very difficult conditions, something that the system with wheels cannot do. And also probably developing robots with uh, this kind of human way of walking can help them integrate better inside our personal environment. Barcelona's PAL Robotics have created multiple walking versions of its Ream robot. But as you can see, there are still a few steps to take before we can see humanoid robots walk the way we do.
Far camminare un robot umanoide è un compito difficile per due motivi, uno dal punto di vista tecnologico e l'altro è un problema teorico. Infatti ancora non abbiamo a disposizione dei motori che riescono a riprodurre alla perfezione l'efficienza dei muscoli umani e dal punto di vista teorico ancora non è stato trovato un algoritmo che riesca a risolvere il problema della camminata da un punto di vista diciamo, completo e generale. Quindi stiamo facendo degli esperimenti che vanno via via migliorando l'efficienza e la robustezza della camminata. ICARP is also learning to walk, progressing in its evolution just like a developing child. And like a child, the robot can interact with the environment to find its balance. So designing um, a robot to walk uh, is certainly a difficult task, but what we more interested is uh, rather how to make a robot that walks and does something useful. Um, I mean, uh, walking, as I said, is difficult, but um, more difficult is to allow the robot to interact with the entire body, which means uh, using the hands while it's maintaining balance uh, is what we're looking for. Uh, in this respect, what we like to do is to have a robot that goes around, open doors, open a drawer, uh, can grasp objects, maybe it leans on a table and a piece of furniture if it needs to, so to stabilize the weight, uh, but does something uh, more than just walking. I mean, the research concentrated on walking per se, but uh, we think we have to do to go one step beyond and uh, uh, manage to really do the interaction while the robot is walking. So ICAMP was designed exactly to study uh, development, to study how you can uh, build a robot which becomes progressively more and more uh, skillful. That uh, it starts by uh, doing just simple movements like controlling the gaze of the eyes and the movement of the head and then, you know, uh, progressively becomes more and more skilled and try to grasp objects and, and uh, eventually at the end the idea is to for the robot to be able to interact with humans through speech and gestures and uh, any other way we usually use when we interact with each other. But ICAP doesn't only gain sensory experience of the world through walking, it also does so thanks to its unique human-like surface, skin. The skin of iCub is a unique feature. Um, I don't think there are other robots in the world that can claim to have a full body skin that covers the robot. It's what allows the robot to feel forces and pressure when it's interacting with the environment, when it's interacting with people. Um, the skin itself uh, is a bit like um, a touch screen on a cell phone, but the technology has been adapted to um, cover the robot, which means basically that it's soft, uh, which is so unlike a touch screen that is uh, rigid and flat, the skin of the iCub is softer and curved to follow the body shape. Uh, it's also sensitive to interaction not only with people but also with objects. Um, so normally a touch screen works only with our fingers. In the case of the iCub it works with whatever the robot touches. And uh, as I said, this is unique, which means uh, that it allows the robot to really feel the environment, to feel the interaction with people, and this is a feature that we need because if we're interacting and we're collecting information, then we can hope to learn something from this interaction. If we cannot sense it, then it will be very difficult. Walking, touch, and the ability to interact safely with the world are all crucial elements of a functional humanoid robot. But something more might be needed to meet the ambitious goal that some robot makers are trying to achieve. Robothespian is about recreating life with a machine. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling, I'm happy again. I'm laughing in a cloud, so dark up above. In Cornwall, England, near Penryn, we meet Robo Thespian, a robot actor that's already performed on stage alongside human actors. 
It's designed as an entertainment machine, but also as a research platform to investigate what elements are necessary to successfully humanize a robot. When you see this robot, we want you to see it as a person, not some metal. And, and that's the aim of Robothespian, is to move and to talk and perform like a human so that you believe that the metal is a human. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of trouble. At Aldebaran Robotics in Paris, we meet another robot who can move and perform with incredibly lifelike capabilities. It's the smallest in our group, and it's one of very few humanoid robots already publicly available. Its name is NOW. NOW can be programmed to perform a vast range of different tasks, and it's proof that the humanoid shape can be effective even at a smaller scale. The humanoid shape that we have chosen for now is very important because we think that is the best way for the robot to interact naturally with people. And if you want to create a real intuitive relationship with a robot, this shape with a nice head, with a little arms, little legs, makes it very, very sympathetic and people want to interact with it. And based on this shape, we have been working a lot on some expression, behaviors, gestures that make the robot living. And, and when you see the robot, you don't see it as an object, but as a little creature that has its own life inside. And that makes the complete difference with a classical object, like this lamp, for instance. These robots are already used in education in uh, several countries. There are 5,000 robots in the education and research field uh, to help young people first entering into this new world, but maybe a, a world which is much more attractive. People learning computer sciences, students learning computer sciences with robots are more involved in their studies, even if they are learning the right same things, the very same thing. But they are more involved in their studies because they are working on the future. So, so there are things that have been demonstrated which turns this robot a very, very powerful way to attract young people towards science and technology, to attract them and help them improving their skills in technology and simply to attract them into, into science. And uh, it will help us having robots everywhere because this new generation of people who are learning with robots uh, will bring the robots in our daily life. But more than that, there are some specific application in education. We are working with uh, autistic kids, we are working um, with educators of autistic kids who are using the robot as a tool. The educator is using the robot, driving the robot, programming, or, sorry, using programs on the robot for having the robot teaching to autistic kids. And autistic kids have uh, other kind of way to interact with people and they are less comfortable in interacting with people and they are very good at interacting with technology. Then we can use this robot which is some kind of very rough uh, human so they are able to interact with and thanks to that they are able to learn some skills of interacting with people. There are now over 5,000 units of this robot in the hands of researchers and developers worldwide making it one of the most widespread open-source robotic platforms in the world. Now uh, has been designed as an open platform. It means that it can be used by today by researchers and teachers and they can program the robot the way they want to use it. And for us it's very interesting and very necessary because today we cannot provide many applications on it as you can have many, many applications on your uh, mobile phone, on your smartphone. Today, we don't have so many applications for now. So it's important that the community uh, we gather around now are able to develop their own application. And with them, we will discover what will be um, uh, now used for. And that is very important for us to, to bring not customers with us, but 
a community of co-workers, people able to develop with us the future of the humanoid robotics. The open source philosophy also applies to iCub. Even though the complexity of the robot and its high cost, around 250,000 euros, limits its availability to academic institutions and research centers. But both the software and hardware of the small baby robot is being used as a collective research platform. The ICAP project is open source, uh, which means that we give uh, what we do, both in software and hardware, uh, to other scientists uh, so that we can share our results. In turn, uh, other people can work on similar problems and give us uh, the same results back to a, a common repository of uh, results. This allows for a faster and uh, more efficient way of developing research because we can accumulate knowledge and this knowledge uh, is uh, you know, available to everybody in a very open scientific way. We, because of this, we now have uh, 28 robots like this one built. 25 of them are uh, around the world, uh, mostly in Europe, but also in the United States, in uh, Japan and in Korea. Um, which means that ICAB, in a sense, is, uh, started as a small project, but is now a worldwide uh, community. The Eche Robot project is yet another example of collaborative robotics. As well as being an open source platform, it also employs innovative technologies for manufacturing and distributing its components. We are committed to an open source approach to developing this technology, partly because the technology is, is very challenging and we need to involve a lot of people to deal with those issues, and partly because the end user needs to be intimately involved with how the robot will function. If this is to become a, an everyday part of our life, our lives, then we, we need it to be something we're very comfortable with. One technology that we're planning to use is 3D printing. Our aim is to produce a completely open platform the software, the hardware, and also the means to assemble it. So we will use 3D printing as a way to distribute the designs in the hope that people will continue our work and then feed it back into the community. Open source started with software, and we know that it produced a really big revolution there. But now we see it more and more applied to, to hardware. That's also thanks to 3D printing or laser cutting, the ability we have to produce pieces much, much faster, so we can collaborate remotely in doing things and assembling things and in making them better. And that can really be a great asset when you think about robotic systems in order to speed up their evolution. A complex discipline like robotics can only benefit from the open source approach, allowing researchers from different fields to put their minds together to come up with new ideas and innovative solutions to existing problems. For example, we're really good at spotting every tiny detail that makes us human, mostly involuntarily. That's why they're trying to replicate some of these often unseen intricacies. The most challenging aspect of designing a robot is everything. They are very, very complicated. There's many levels. You have to understand electronics, mechanics, computer programming. You have to understand actually what people want to see. It's a lot about managing people's expectations and then trying to make everything work at once. So really, I'd say the really challenging aspect is just management of very many tiny details. If we want to build robots that can interact with human beings, then they need to behave like human beings. The concept of the interface is very important for every technology. And you know, in the case of robots, learning from the way we interface with each other as humans, call it the human element, then can become very, very important. RIM nasce per aiutare le persone, però per fare questo c'è bisogno anche che sia accettato dalle persone. In questo modo abbiamo sviluppato dei movimenti involontari che il robot riproduce in momenti di pausa. Per esempio il movimento delle mani, il fatto di seguire lo sguardo delle persone, o anche solamente camminando, il fatto di imitare la camminata umana con il movimento del torso e delle braccia. The small details are very important when it comes to designing robots. 
human beings prefer interacting with beings that are similar to them. The more similar we feel to something, the more closer we feel to it. So if the small details make a robot more human-like, it will facilitate the social interaction with the robot. But no matter how much care goes into the details, robots will always invite very strong responses from people. In general, we're attracted to them as a result of a mix of curiosity and awe, and their appearance can lead to wildly different reactions. Yeah, people react in very different ways. Some people are quite afraid of a robot. Young children tend to just accept it as if it's another person. Uh, we had one person who, who threatened to kill the robot and tried to attack it. That was uh, when we were at a show in Germany. Uh, became very aggressive and said that the robot didn't have proper blood in its veins and he should kill it. Um, so people, there are strong reactions and I think this is, if you make a machine that looks like a person, there's something quite profound about that. It's almost the Frankenstein story. It's, uh, it's men playing God, if you will, recreating life mechanically. And that upsets some people. Other people are very entertained by it. So. Something which came as a bit of a surprise was how much people liked the robot that was produced. Although it looks like a person with no skin and you can see all the inner details, people weren't put off at all. In fact, they seemed fascinated by it. But what happens when robots really start to look like us? At Bristol Robotics Lab, we find jewels. It is a robotic head made with soft materials that can recreate amazingly realistic human expressions. If it had a full body, it would be called an android. Androids are humanoid robots that look like human beings. Even though they are largely confined to science fiction, some have already been built, mostly in Korea and Japan. But creating an android poses more than a technological challenge. It also forces roboticists to venture into a delicate realm known as the Uncanny Valley. The Uncanny Valley is this idea that if you imagine a line where on the one end we have something completely non-human-like, like a ball with two eyes on it, and on the other end you have an actual human, then as you move towards the human, you enter a region when you get close to a human, but not quite, where there is this sense of uncanniness, something that is just off, that is kind of eerie and disturbing to people. Of course, once you get to an actual human or something that is indistinguishable from a human, that disappears. But you have this valley before you get to that point. Or at least uh, so the theory goes. Now, I think it's more complicated than that. Um, a lot depends on the context, uh, what your expectations are. And even something very non-anthropomorphic, like a Disney cartoon figure. If Mickey Mouse suddenly popped out here in the midst of all, it might actually be quite disturbing, even if it would not even be close to human-like. Um, so I think we have to take this concept with a grain of salt. There's very little psychological research about the uncanny valley. So far it's a very hypothetical construct. However, I believe it's a very meaningful construct. I've personally experienced the uncanny valley. I was part of a project where I had a replica of my face made and put onto a robot and the replica was a tiny bit off and I felt mortified. It was terrible. It felt super awkward. I ran out of the room. I had a very personal emotional experience of the Uncanny Valley. Also, the prosthetic hand I used to wear when I was a teenager had a cosmetic glove that was supposed to mimic the human hand, but it was this tiny bit off and just looked awkward and awful. So to that regard, I've already had two very powerful emotional exp experiences of the Uncanny Valley. So I believe it's real. And yet, the most fascinating challenge for roboticists lies not in recreating the perfect human appearance, but the perfect human intelligence. An intelligence that can learn and adapt while operating within the confines of a humanoid body. One of the ways to reach this goal is through something called cognitive robotics.
So the key aspect of the investigation for the ICAB is what is called cognitive robotics, which is aimed at studying uh, what, what may be called the mental aspects of, of robotics, not necessarily related to how you move motors or acquire images or other sensory, but how you reason about uh, uh, information coming from your sensory channels and how you uh, predict, uh, for example, what is going to happen in, in the future. So the, the, it is a sort of an evolution of what once was called artificial intelligence uh, uh, with the main difference that uh, uh, it's, not, it's not anymore a simple uh, mental process like a chess, uh, a chess player, but it involves the movement of the body and the physical interaction with the world and with other uh, persons, with other agents. Uh, robots in the future, they have to be uh, cognitive, so they have to integrate millions of inputs from the uh, sensorial uh, system like uh, vision, hearing and so on and have to be capable to integrate and to interpret all this information uh, and ultimately to make decisions. So neuroscience, studying brain, understanding brain, cognition are getting the, are getting the most important sciences uh, to make a robot uh, capable of thinking. To properly interact with a person, the robot needs to understand the person's intentions. So when we interact with each other uh, in doing uh, collaborative jobs, for example, like lifting objects together or uh, closing a box uh, together or passing objects one to the other, uh, what we usually exchange is not only forces, uh, but also information. And we do that in sort of an implicit way. So it's not, uh, an, a, it's not a message which we uh, state explicitly, but it's the way we move, the way we, we, we reach for object, the way we accelerate when uh, we lift uh, something. These kind of, of, of messages uh, are implicit uh, in, in the way we are built, in our muscles, in our body, in our uh, hands. And the fact that the HICAB has an anthropomorphic shape uh, allows us to exploit these messages and try to understand what are the real features which are important uh, to convey uh, information when, when we work together. So this is one of the topics of, of uh, the research uh, we are actually doing now. ILA is also able to learn by observation, the, what is called uh, imitation learning, where we have a human operator showing some examples of certain tasks and the robot is looking at this person or getting the information from the movements of this person and after some examples the robot is also able to reproduce the same movements, the same tasks. Like a child learns the coordination between hand and eye autonomously, also with this robot we try to not pre-program it but to make it learn the task by simply executing it multiple times. Right now, we're dealing with imitation and simple tasks. But many scientists believe that in the near future, we'll be able to create super-intelligent autonomous entities. And if that happens, robot makers may be required to take ethics into account. If a robot developed the same mental attributes as a human being, it should also have the same rights as a human being. Not to do so, would be a form of racism. By the time a robot becomes capable of making decisions, a question arises. Uh, should we consider the robot as responsible for its actions? I mean, it, it sounds maybe not very mature at the stage right now, but in the future this will be an issue. A cognitive machine capable of making decisions might have responsibilities. Uh, in case of mistakes, should we punish the machine or not? I mean, something similar uh, happens today with something much simpler like internet. We underestimated in the past the importance of having extremely fast information, uh, anonymous information, uh, running on the net. And now we're starting asking ourselves whether this uh, has some ethic implications, uh, if uh, everything is well done. So I think with machines that will be physically interacting with humans, this will become much more important in the future. And maybe it's time now to start thinking what could be a solution. A 
ethical issues should be part of robotic design because ethics come in where robots have to make autonomous decisions. If a robot cannot process what it experiences based on prior knowledge, it has to make a new autonomous decision. And I'd prefer if some ethical guidelines would be in place for making such autonomous decisions. Intelligence is the most powerful force in the universe. In this century, we may create machine super intelligence, machines that will surpass us in every intellectual dimension. And if we ever build super intelligent machines, how can we be sure that they will not be harmful or even a threat to our very existence? It's a hugely difficult product to try to build a machine that is as intelligent as a human being. Um, it's also a hugely difficult challenge to figure out if you had such a machine, how could you make sure that it would want to do the right thing, that it would have some sort of human-friendly values. Both of these challenges will ultimately have to be tackled. But the sequence is crucial. We've got to solve the second challenge, the control problem, before we figure out how to solve the intelligence problem. We need to know how to control an intelligent machine before we build an intelligent machine. Being afraid of evil robots taking over the world is a natural thing. It's caused by the way we perceive other beings. The two core dimensions of social perceptions are warmth and competence. If we perceive a robot, we perceive a robot as socially cold. But a robot is, of course, very competent. It's a complex machine. Whenever we perceive something as cold and competent, the reaction it instills in us is fear. So a fearful reaction towards robots is very human in a way. And therefore, I think this is the explanation for why we believe that robots can be a threat. I also believe that that is not warranted because Robots being a threat implies them being intelligent and having evil intentions, both of which I think of, is very improbable. Machines are evolving very, very rapidly, so the idea of machines taking over has been a recurring fear of humanity. But I wouldn't be so concerned, because I think that in between just a machine or a human, if you have the human plus the machines, will always win against both of the atoms. If robots become a threat, it won't be because of their guns, it'll be because of their brains. The most important question is not how we will treat our AIs or robots, but how they will treat us. In the long run, our future will be in their hands.